The sweeping grandeur of the Pacific Northwest coastline is captured in postcard perfect images of fishing boats slowly maneuvering through the majestic waters. But its calm and serenity can be deceiving. The force and power of these ocean waters can turn deadly without warning. On June 4, 1995, Craig Ringheimer and Greg Calavan set out for a day on the water, not realizing the danger that lay ahead. The two were longtime friends. Well, I've known him for about 15 years. I met him down where I live, met him at the river. Ever since then, I just kept in contact and just hunt together, fish together, dive together. It was an unusually warm and sunny day when Greg and Craig decided to go crabbing on Oregon's Yakina Bay. Well, we went out and we dropped our pots and we, just, we it took us probably half hour to get them set where we wanted and we went through and you know pulled the first ones we dropped. We did that a couple times and didn't get anything that was worth keeping so we decided you know, to kind of kill some time, just head out and just go explore a little bit. And so, they steered their 15-foot boat out of the protected bay and down the channel towards the open sea. It was real smooth going out, and it was real nice out there, nothing real big. I mean, we could see land the whole time. We weren't dropping down in, in between the, the waves. But as they ventured farther out into the open waters, the wind began picking up, and the waves started getting larger. And then that's when we decided we'd better turn around and head back. And I saw a little bit of water splashing up over the bow, and I. I heard the motor rev up a little bit, and I looked back, and I noticed that that wave was, you know, was kind of pushing the back end of the boat up, and I looked back forward, and next thing I know, I was diving into the water, and the boat was flipping over. Station of Corner Bay, Petty Officer Rupert, may I help you? It was approximately 5.30 p.m. when the Yakina Bay Coast Guard Station received the 911 call. Now line off, motor lifeboat, vessel capsized inside North Reef, two persons in the water. Laura Shoemaker was part of the team that day. The SAR alarm went off, everybody jumped up, ran down to the boat as we were running down to the boat. They piped over the loudspeakers that we've had two people in the water, boat capsized on North Reef. And everybody knows here that that's like a really bad area to be. And we had to get out there. So we were all in high speed mode that day. The team moved quickly, preparing the 44-foot motor lifeboat for a dangerous surf rescue. Because they piped that we had two people in the water in the surf zone, we knew that we had to wear extra gear. Anytime the boat enters a surf zone, we have to wear belts and helmets. And we had basically the time from when we launched here to get out around the tips to plan what we were going to do. Help was on the way, but the 50-degree water and the six to eight-foot swells had already taken their toll on the two victims. Each wave that hit would take them under until they could fight their way back to the surface. And then we'd kind of look over our shoulders, and we'd say, here comes another one, here comes another one. And we'd say, OK, take a breath, and then duck down. A few miles away at the Coast Guard Newport Air Facility, Lieutenant Harry Allen and his helicopter team were also responding to the call. On the way out to the helicopter, I had the swimmer dress out in his uh, water ensemble, and uh, I told them to prepare for a direct deployment to the surf. My crew and I uh, dressed out in our gear, got the helicopter ready, and started it up and taxied out and approximately a minute to two minutes later we were on scene overhead of the victims. What we saw when we arrived was a capsized boat with uh, two men clinging to the stern being hit by six to eight foot surf. The two men had been in the frigid water for over 30 minutes and hypothermia was beginning to set in. I could hold on but it just felt like that I had a hard time keeping my muscles tight because they kept wanting to shake. The Coast Guard's lifeboat had also arrived on the scene, but was having trouble locating the two victims. Coxswain Kevin Ramsey explains. Standing outside, if you're looking in across the surf, it's impossible to see anything inside. We had no idea whether they were, they could have been anywhere from right next to the rock still four miles north of Puke went ahead. We didn't know where the guys were until the helicopter got, a, got on top of them. Uh, so once we could see where they were at, uh, we started backing in towards them. 
and we got uh, we got alongside the boat just about the same time that the rescue swimmer was being lowered down. When I'm sitting in the door, I'm basically thinking, okay, I've got to get that guy first or, or that guy first, or I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to get both these guys out of the danger that they're in. Rescue swimmer Thomas Golden was lowered directly into the pounding surf. When I went down, uh, gave them both a thumbs up, they gave me a thumbs up back, and uh, so I decided to take the closest guy to me. I was watching him, and he pointed at me and motioned me over there, so I let go, and I just swam over to him, and he asked me if I was okay. And I said, yeah, and just a little cold. I was basically concentrating on getting him in the strop, and just as I had finished getting him in the strop, uh, this wave hit us. It toppled the craft and both of the people along with the swimmer, and we lost sight of him for several seconds. I looked down, I was coming up out of the water, next thing I know, I look up, I'm right below the helicopter. I looked down again, I was above the jetty, and then they set me down. Craig was finally safe on shore, but his friend was still struggling to stay alive. In the few minutes that the helo was dropping the guy on the jetty, if we hadn't been in there to pick the guy up, another break and wave could have taken him completely off the boat. Once they lifted the first person out of the water and started moving towards the jetty, then and we started backing into the boat again. Myself and the other crewman on the boat grabbed a rescue throw bag to try and get a line to him to pull him on board. Now it was up to Greg to let go of the capsized boat and somehow swim to the small throw bag that marked his only lifeline. Our first shots, he couldn't get to them. Second shot we made, he grabbed hold of the line and he was able to hold on to it while we pulled him alongside the boat. And this whole time, we had waves breaking right alongside the boat. It was a fight to hold him on. And the boat was rocking so hard that it, I really had to hang on to the boat. And uh, once I got hold of that boat, though, I wasn't going to let go. Finally, the crew was able to get Greg on board. I figured I was saved. <laughs> I was gone. I, remember, you know, I was real cold. I was just thanking him for getting me in the boat. Greg and Craig were transported to a hospital where they were treated for hypothermia and released later that day. Oh, yeah. I'm Oh my life to him, you know, they saved mine, saved me, and, and I just really appreciate it. I'm glad they're there. Without the swift action of the helicopter and lifeboat teams, the chances for these two men to survive was almost non-existent. And even with all their professional training, the conditions that day required more than just skill and precision to succeed. It took a miracle for everything to fall into place and for these lives to be saved.